It is common for prisons to offer training that could help inmates find jobs and re-enter society following their releases. The most desirable among these offerings, such as electronics repair, are difficult courses to get into. However, in 1995, three inmates who were intent on escaping from Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight managed to find themselves working in the prison's metal shop. Murderers Keith Rose and Andrew Roger, as well as bomb maker and arsonist Matthew Williams, devised a rather ingenious plan to escape, and it was all made possible by their jobs working with sheet metal. One day, the three men were able to hide inside the prison some gymnasium undetected until nightfall so they could put their plan into action. They were going to need to get to the workshop, but that was not a problem. By carefully memorizing the shape of a guard's master key, they'd been able to construct a reasonable replica. Despite only having seen the key in passing, as obviously no guard would allow them to examine it, their duplicate key worked in unlocking every door that they'd need to in order to escape. This key was the only object they needed to smuggle out of their workshop, and once they were back inside, they were able to retrieve the two other objects they'd created. One was a 25-foot ladder segmented into three parts that they would use to scale the prison wall, and the other was a homemade gun that they fortunately would never need to use. Using their homemade key to unlock every door standing between them and their freedom, the three men carried the ladder straight to the prison wall and just climbed out. While some maximum security prisons in 1995 already had touch-sensitive walls, Pinehurst was not one of them, meaning that there was nothing to alert the guards to the escape underway. The men made it out of the prison and then left the replica key at a mailbox just 200 yards away from in the prison. It is believed that someone was intended to retrieve it and smuggle it back inside, but police found it first. While the men may have escaped from the prison walls, they were still trapped. The Isle of Wight is only about 15% the size of Rhode Island, so there's no way three wanted men could just disappear into obscurity to live the rest of their lives in peace. They needed to escape the island, but they weren't interested in trying to build a boat or take a ferry or where they would have been sitting ducks for authorities. Though they did plan to get off the island, this is where their plan fell apart. The men hiked 10 miles away from the prison towards a small private airport. Keith was trained as a pilot, so they intended to steal a plane and fly to freedom. The airport was a popular hub for tourists in the summer, but they planned their escape for a Sunday in the winter. When they arrived, there was only a single plane in the hangar, a Cessna 105. This model of plane is generally used for flight training. It only has two seats. It was unlikely that it could have even taken off with three men inside, but they were unable to get the plane started. With their plan thwarted, the three convicts hid in abandoned barns while trying to devise a new way to escape from the island. The private airport would no longer have been an option, as their first attempt would have been enough to alert authorities. You see, they'd primed the door to the Cessna open with a crowbar and left a piece of broken metal in the ignition after the failed attempt to get it started. After four days in hiding, an off-duty prison warden happened to recognize Matthew's unusual gait as the three men inexplicably strolled down a major road together in the early evening. He quickly called for backup, and the area was soon swarmed with officers and police dogs. The two murderers surrendered immediately, but the arsonist still thought he could escape. He tried to flee, but aware that the direction he chose to run was leading him directly back to the prison. They may not have made it very far before being recaptured, but escaping prison by reconstructing a key from memory is still pretty incredible. Choi Ge Bok was a 49-year-old career criminal from South Korea. Constantly in and out of prison for repeated theft, Choi spent over two decades total behind bars. Most of his time in prison was spent practicing yoga, something that would be crucial for his eventual escape. Of course, Choi's most famous escape wasn't actually his first escape. His first attempt had taken place over 20 years earlier when he slipped through the bars on a prison bus while being transported. But in 2012, Choi had a much more incredible escape to make. He was being detained in a jail cell in the Daegu Police Station after being arrested on suspicion of robbery despite his insistence that he was being framed. After five days in custody, it was time for him to make his escape. Troy waited until around 5 a.m. when all three guards fell asleep. He then coated his head and upper body skin in ointment before putting his decades of yoga training to the test. At the bottom of the cell was a food slot, just 5.9 inches tall and 17.7 inches wide. According to the surveillance footage, it took Troy only 34 seconds to squeeze and contort his body through the small opening. From there, the framed thief was able to run out of the police station and to a nearby home where he stole a credit card, car keys, and subsequently a car. Police set up roadblocks and checkpoints to 
try and find Choi, but he caught wind of their plan and was able to ditch the car shortly before one of the checkpoints. However, he was still leaving little clues that would help the police track his movement. For example, a 58-year-old farmer found a note in his heart that read, I am sorry, signed, framed thief Choi Gabok. The farmer initially ignored this note as a prank until a day or two later when he realized that the framed thief had stolen food from his home, at which point he contacted the police. Choi managed to stay on the run for six days, but numerous reported sightings led police to Miyang, a little over 25 miles from Daegu. They were able to track Choi to the roof of an apartment building where he was sleeping in a cardboard box. He was returned to Daegu police station where the officers locked him in a cell with a much smaller food slot. Frank Abagnale's legendary escapes from the FBI were the subject of the 2002 film Catch Me If You Can, starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Frank. Starting at the age of 15, Frank began a career as a Czech forger and con man. His life of crime sent him around the globe, spending time in prisons in France and Sweden before being deported to the US, where there was a warrant for his arrest. It was in America that he would allegedly make his two great escapes. The first time he escaped was from a British airplane at JFK Airport. He had just been deported back to the United States, where he was going to be taken into custody, but he escaped from the VZ-10 jet by removing the toilet and climbing through the drainage. Frank then exited the jet while it was being taxied and fled the runway, hopping over a fence. But his more impressive stunt came once he was actually in custody. Frank was being transported to the U.S. penitentiary in Atlanta, but the U.S. Marshal forgot his detention commitment papers. This struck the prison's administration as more than a little odd. Many prisons throughout the U.S. were being inspected for civil rights violations at the time, and the guards suspected that Frank may have been an undercover agent sent there to inspect the prison. Frank overheard the guards discussing their suspicions, so he decided to take advantage of it. He called a friend of his and instructed her to bring him two fake business cards. One card would identify him as an FBI agent, and the other was to be that of his boss. She visited Frank and prison and was able to slip him the business cards undetected. With the business cards in hand, Frank finally revealed to the guards his alleged true identity as an FBI inspector. He said that he needed to get out so that he could speak with his superior and urged them to call the number on the second business card that he had presented. The guards had suspected that this was the case all along, and Frank had been receiving better than average treatment as a prisoner thanks to their belief that he was actually FBI. And this story all but confirmed it, but they still needed to call the phone number that he had provided to back up his story. And of course, that phone number on the second business card just went to a payphone at the local mall where his friend was waiting to pick up. She answered, pretending to be a phone operator for the FBI. The background noise of the mall undoubtedly made it sound like a busy call center, lending further credibility to the ruse. Frank was released, and the guards allowed him to walk right out of the prison door. Then again, it's unclear whether or not either of these stories actually happened. The only source of the claims is Frank himself, and as a known liar and con man, it hardly makes him a credible source. While it's true that neither the FBI nor the penitentiary would be keen to corroborate the stories as it would make them look bad, many experts have pointed out the physical impossibility of how he claimed to have escaped from the plane. Halloween is a favorite holiday for many, but if you were working as a prison guard, you probably wouldn't expect anyone to show up to work in a Halloween costume. And you definitely wouldn't expect that to happen in early February. But in 2015, that's the exact scenario two prison guards were met with in Nova Mutum in Brazil. Two girls showed up at the prison at around 3 in the morning, carrying whiskey and dressed up in a revealing leather police costumes, and they asked the guards if they could come inside to chat and drink. Despite the scenario being so ludicrous that even the porn industry would scoff and write off the plot as too unrealistic, the guards failed to realize how suspicious it was, and they let the girls in. They began drinking, and it didn't take long for the girls to seduce the guards, convincing the guards to take them back to the staff sleeping quarters. But neither guard can remember anything that happened that night after they began drinking the whiskey that the girls brought, whiskey that naturally had been drugged. While the guards slept, the girls stole their keys and released all 28 inmates from the prison. They grabbed three rifles, two revolvers, and armloads worth of ammunition from the prison's weapons before strolling out of the front door. The escape is believed to have been orchestrated by 18-year-old Bruno Amore. Bruno was serving time for firearms possession and attempted murder, and it is believed that he was responsible for planning the escape with the help of his girlfriend, or one of the two girls that showed up to seduce the guards. Both guards, as well as the warden, were arrested on charges of facilitating a jailbreak and culpable embezzlement, the latter charge related to the stolen firearms. While the warden wasn't directly involved in the inappropriate behavior, he was deemed to be responsible as well, since he was on site at the time, but he slept through the entire prison break. The girls left behind the bottle of drugged whiskey, the glasses they drank from, and a bag containing their lingerie and leather police costumes. The bag also contained a sealed condom wrapper, possibly showing how far they were willing to take their plan if the drugs didn't kick in fast enough.
Despite closing its doors over 60 years ago, Alcatraz remains one of the most famous American prisons of all time. Endearingly referred to as The Rock, the prison was regarded as being completely inescapable. So naturally, the potential escape of three inmates from such a notorious prison remains the most famous prison break of all time. It took place on June 12, 1962, after months of preparation. Prisoners Frank Morris, Alan West, and John and Clarence Anglin had all known each other from the time they served together in other prisons. And John and Clarence also knew each other because they were brothers. But the four men had adjoining cells, which gave them the opportunity to work together and plan something in secret. They began by widening the openings in the air vents under their sinks using spoons stolen from the mess hall, discarded saw blades found on the prison grounds, and an improvised drill powered by a vacuum cleaning motor. This early work was done during music hour, when ambient music was pumped through the cell block. Frank further concealed the noise by playing his accordion. Once the hole was large enough, they were able to crawl out of their cells into the utility corridor behind them. There, they were able to build a secret workshop to build their escape raft. But first, they needed to make sure their absence from their cells would have been noticed. To accomplish that, the men constructed dummy heads out of soap, toothpaste, toilet paper, and concrete dust. This concoction acted as a form of papier-mâché to create the fake heads. The heads were then painted a flesh color, and hair from the floor of the prison barbershop was glued onto them to make them look more realistic. While these dummy heads were impressive given the resources they had available, they would not have stood up to any scrutiny. Fortunately for the four men, they were good enough to fool any guards who might have glanced at them during the night. This gave them the entire night to work together, sewing raincoats into a 6 foot by 14 foot raft. Liquid plastic was stolen and used as a sealant, and they were able to use steam pipes in the utility corridor as a source of heat for their construction. On the night of June the 11th, the men were ready to make their escape. Unfortunately for Alan, he wasn't going to be able to join his colleagues. The concrete around his vent had been crumbling, so he needed to use cement the night before to reseal it and hold the grill in place. Otherwise, guards would have seen the grill on the floor and the giant hole in the wall. But the cement had hardened during the day, fastening the grill tightly to the wall and shrinking the hole. By the time Ballon was finally able to remove the grill and widen the hole to fit through, Frank, John, and Clarence had already left without him. Once the other three were in the utility corridor, they climbed a ventilation shaft to the roof. From there, they were able to slide down a pipe. Then all they had to do was scale a pair of 12-foot barbed wire fences. Thanks to their planning, they knew there was a blind spot in the large network of searchlights near the power plants on the northeast corner of the island. This gave them plenty of time to scale the walls, inflate the raft using a concertina stolen from another inmate to use as bellows, and get their raft into the ocean without fear of being spotted. Three men boarded the homemade raft, grabbed their homemade oars, and departed towards Angel Island two miles to the north. The escape wasn't noticed until the next morning, but by then it was too late. For ten days, law enforcement searched for the escaped convicts by land, air, and sea, but no sign of them was found. An oar and traces of the raft were found off the coast of Angel Island, along with a few of their personal belongings, but no sign of their bodies was ever located. The official story is that they drowned. That was the same fate as everyone else who had attempted to escape Alcatraz, but in every other instance, the bodies were found. Many believe that they did escape, and that the Anglin brothers traveled to Brazil where they started a new life. In later years, family members claimed to have been in contact with the brothers, and in 2013, a letter claiming to be written by John Anglin arrived at the San Francisco Police Department from Brazil. But all such evidence has been ruled inconclusive. However, if the letter is to be believed, then Frank passed away in 2008, and Clarence did in 2011. John was offering to turn himself in and tell what had happened for the 50 years following their escape in exchange for medical treatment for his cancer. Since the letter was deemed inconclusive, no such deal was made, and the fate of the three men remains a mystery.